Okay, so we're back in the set now for another GMBN Tech Weekly Show. Now, coming up on the show this week, we've got some news on the Canyon women-specific bikes, which are very nice. A very exclusive downhill bike that only 15 people are going to be able to ride. And all the usual stuff for you guys. Okay, so straight into tech news, and there's a whole bunch of cool stuff I want to talk to you this week. But the first one is something I wouldn't normally talk about on GMBN Tech. Normally something for those boys over at EMBM, but I thought you should see it because it's the brand new Canyon Spectral On. So that's their 150 mil travel e-bike. So some people feel strongly against them. Some people love them. Personally, I sit on the fence at the moment. I've ridden them. I think they're really, really good fun. And there's so much potential to them. So you just have to check this thing out. It's a bit of a work of art, to be honest. So it's a full carbon fiber frame. There's 150 mil travel front and rear. It's running the Shimano Steps E8000 system on there. So plenty of torque and it's one of the lighter, smaller systems. Interestingly though, it's got an external battery on top of the down tube and they've done this to it'd be typically German, be really efficient with the design. It's a, an obvious thing to do. However, I'm not so, too sure about the looks myself. I need to actually spend a bit of time with the bike. As you can see on screen now, Steve Jones over from EMBN, he's been riding that bike already and he's got plenty to say about it. So make sure you head over to EMBN later on to check that out. In the meantime, I wanna pick up something you might not have noticed about this bike. Look at the wheels on it. Up front, it's running a 29er with 2.5 inch tire and out back, it's running a 27.5 with a 2.8 inch tire. It's got a little 165 mil crank, so you're not bottoming out on the floor all the time when you're pedaling up through aggressive and sort of technical terrain. It's really interesting, they've gone for the bigger wheel up front and the smaller wheel out back, kind of like Fantic bikes also do. It's a bit of a motocross themed thing and I think you're going to start seeing that across some other e-bikes because unlike downhill bikes and cross-country bikes, they're not subject to UCI ruling yet. So I think there could be some interesting things coming and I'm sure there would be benefits in the downhill bike department to do exactly that. We shall see. But there is one thing to just mention about the Canyon bike. Obviously, it's a direct sale bike, which means that you buy the bike from the website, it gets shipped directly to where you live. Now, being an e-bike, it's a little bit of a problem because you can't really ship these bikes everywhere because of the nature of the batteries. So for the time being, they're only going to be available in five markets. So that is Australia, France, Germany, Italy, and the UK. But things will be changing. So we will update you with that when we know. So next up is another bit of news from Canyon Bicycles. And then this time is none e-bikes, so regular mountain bikes. But again, this one is slightly different. This is designed especially for women. So there's the new Spectral and the Grand Canyon range. And they go down to 2XS size. So 2XS, XS, small and medium is what they have in that range. Now they've all got lower bottom brackets and on normal bikes to make the rider feel like they're sat into the bike for a bit more stability. The top tubes are a lot lower slung and the suspension kinematics have been revamped basically. So it's a lot more supple and initial sort of stroke. And the reason for that is just to reflect the lighter weight of the sort of riders that are gonna be intended to ride those bikes. Now they've also got some really nice women's specific components on there like the SDG Allure saddle, which I hear is a really popular saddle for women riders. And there's both alloy and carbon fiber models. All the crank sizes are 170 mil, so a lot shorter on those. The 2XS size is currently only gonna be available in the alloy frame models because it's such a niche, small size. It's got a 378 mil reach. That's how tiny that bike is. And then the mediums go up to 430 reach. So there's quite a good basis of bikes there. But visually, they look the same as the, the men's frames, just basically they're a lot smaller and just vamped up for women. I think they're really, really cool. Make sure you have a look at those. So next up is suspension related news from RockShox. So they've got an update to all of their entry level and budget forks. So the first one is the Sector, which now gets a Debon Air spring in there. So it's a lot more responsive and supple throughout the travel, but especially on that initial part of the stroke. And it's also a boost chassis now. So it can take 29 inch wheels. It can take the plus size. And of course that's one 10 mil spacing. So retail pricing for the new Sector in dollars is 429 to 499, to, depending on which particular model. In euros, that's 479 to 549. And in pounds sterling, it's 429 to 499. Next up is the Recon, which is the same fork that I have on my Scouts, but this is the new improved version. It's got the fast black uppers on there. They're still steel, so as opposed to alloy ones on other models fork, but they're black and they look really sleek. So I do think the steel ones in the sort of the polished finish do manage to look a little bit cheaper. So having them black just looks really nice on the bike. They've got a brand new compression knob and an air cap system. They've got new cable remote compatible and they've got new graphics. 
One thing I've yet to find out though is if they're compatible with air volume spaces because they've got that new air cap system. I'm gonna find that out and let you know ASAP on that one. Retail pricing on the dollars front is 249 to 319, euros 279 to 349, pound sterling 249 to 319. And then there's loads of other updates on the Judy, the 30 gold and the 30 silver. So it's really good to see the rocks. So paying attention to the entry level, like the core part of the bike market. It's so important to make sure that anyone riding those sort of bikes has a good experience because ultimately that's what makes you want to stay in mountain biking and spend more money in the long term. And of course, two other models are for the Bluto and the Pike Dirt Jump. So they're both very niche forks, but they've also had updates and improvements. So Nice one, RockShox, you've been working pretty hard on those rolling updates. So next up is something from Greg Minar, and this is real tech, because this is an app dedicated for mountain biking social media. This is really cool, it's a free app called Whip MTB. You can get it on the App Store for both iPhones and Android-based phones. Now, as I said, this thing is completely free, and you choose on it who you want to follow. So if I just go up here, for example, and just show you on screen, I'm following a whole bunch of different people. And so you can see there's Vital, there's Enduro, there's Pinkbike, there's GMBN right there. Make sure you follow us if you do that. And what it does, it puts all of the latest news, videos, stories in, that in one place. So you don't have to scour all the websites every day to find out this stuff. It's delivered to you on your mobile phone. So I think that's a really cool app. And it's really good to see like Minar at the front of that. So look out for our content on here. Of course, plenty of other good content online, but uh, all about GMBN, surely. Right, so you know I'm quite a big fan of the Uno bikes that come from Barcelona. Now two of them, the Dash and the Burn, so that's the trail bike and the Enduro bike, they're both now available to buy. So they're not cheap, these are ultimate super bikes, they're handmade carbon fibre masterpieces. 5,000 euros a piece these are, but if you want a real piece of sort of technological advancement in mountain bike design, it's going to cost you 5,000 euros to get one of these. It's only 50 of each being made. So obviously they're made in Barcelona. The Burn is 160 mil travel with 27 and a half inch wheels and that is an enduro race bike. And it's quite possibly the nicest looking enduro bike on earth. I might be wrong, but comment below and let us know what you think. I think it's absolutely knockout. But the other model is the one I would be more interested in. It's the Dash. And that's 130 mil travel. That's a trail bike and it's got 29 inch wheels. That, as far as I'm concerned, that's the nicest bike on earth right now. Let us know what you think in the comments. And next up is another carbon fiber related thing, also from Cesar Rojo, who's the man that designs the Uno bikes, of course, is the new Intense M29 as raced by Jack Moyer. So this is 29 inch wheel carbon fiber masterpiece of a downhill bike. There's only gonna be 15 of these available worldwide to buy. So if you want arguably one of the best downhill bikes available on the market right now, you can get them. And these things are quite unbelievable, right? So we've got 29-inch wheels, a 63 and a half degree head angle, really long extended wheelbase. We haven't got the full geometry specs right now, but we can get some more specs for you. And of course, they are designed by Cesar Rojo, so these things are going to be like a rocket ship. But just look at the finish on these things. I always think that Intense have that Formula One kind of feel about them, a real true race thoroughbred of a bike. Paintwork and stuff, just absolutely stunning. A lot of that detailing has been done by intense main man Jeff Steber himself in California. So what you're buying there really is a work of racing art. Finally in news, it's the start of the UCI World Cup. Starting this weekend, in fact, and I am off to Stellenbosch in South Africa tomorrow for the first round of the XCO. So if there's any sort of XC tech, XC bikes, race bikes, any of that stuff you guys want to see, let me know in those comments and I'll be looking at the comments while I'm at the airport getting ready to get on the plane. I cannot wait to see all the cool new tech there. I really hope I can see some of that SRAM ETAP stuff, although I do suspect a lot of that's going to be kept out of the way from the media. And maybe you might even see this Fox Live system too. Watch this space. So now it's time for a reader comments. Let's pick up on last week's show and see what you guys had to say. So first up is from Doug Blees. Oi, you should still take the visor leaf tear offs home. No litter, full stop. Some visor leaf around waiting to biodegrade is still litter and it will encourage others to litter. Yeah, do you know what? That is a very good point. Whatever you take in the wood, you should be taking out. I was merely pointing out if you absolutely have to use tear offs and leave them there, they are the ones you should leave because they do. Biodegrade. But of course, you all know if you do see a little when you're out riding, pick it up, take it with you. Be a good Samaritan, get rid of that stuff. I always take a little bag with me inside my riding bag, and I do see stuff out on the trails, I'll pick it up and take it with me and dispose of it later on. So anyone should do that. Next up is from Louis Nelson. 
I have nothing against X-Fusion forks, however, I think a pair of Formula forks with all those fantastic compression settings would be amazing on the Nomad. Love the show, by the way. Uh, thanks, Louis. And actually, do you know, I'm so torn on this because I was looking at the DVOs again the other day and they're super nice as well. It's a really nice fork. Of course, the X-Fusion is a great fork, but that Formula, I think you're right, you know, I'm, I am veering that way because those compression dials on the top, they're, they're so nice. And there's got to be a load of tunability stuff you could do that fork too. And especially with the sort of the prototype air spring that we might be seeing, that they haven't let, let on, but I think that might be coming. So uh, more news on that later on. Next up is from Will McCurrick. Uh, Hi Doddy, I have got a Nuke Proof Warhead headset. They're exactly the same as the Hope with replaceable bearings, but only 30 quid and last just as long. Far cheaper also. Yeah, do you know what? That's a great tip. And that's exactly the sort of thing I was hoping you guys are gonna pick me out on. So I said, I said the Hope headset because it's great quality. It's not the most expensive out there. And of course, all the parts are replaceable separately. But like you just said, the Nuke Proof is a really good option. So I'm definitely gonna be looking at that one. Uh, next up is from Max B in response to the rally bike that like I mentioned last week. Uh, hey Doddy, Rally were a quality bike builder. It was only their later years when they started to make lower end bikes. There's a really good documentary on BBC4 on Rally, which is worth a watch. Um, I've had someone else tell me that documentary is on BBC4. I've not seen it, so I'm gonna have a look on iPlayer and see if I can find that. Cause that definitely, that's of interest to me because obviously they were based in Nottingham originally, sort of in the Midlands of the UK or North Midlands. Um, yeah, you're right, Rally have been a quality bike builder for many years, and of course they did the special products division, so they did some really, really nice mountain bikes, like the Dynatech ones, which had like a titanium and carbon and metal matrix and all sorts of fancy stuff. But they have always made budget bikes as well, but I think what you're referring to is they just stopped making that high-end stuff and they churned out a lot more low-end sort of price point stuff. Nothing wrong with that, they're still nice bikes, but of course they weren't that sort of handmade sort of feeling bike manufacture that Rally was known for in the early days. But I will check that documentary out and if I find a link to it, I'll share it on my Facebook page and on the GMBN Tech Facebook page. And the last comment, this one made me smile actually, from Thomas Redifer. Wait, a little bit of DJing. I want to hear Doddy rock the house. Well, I said that I haven't played for years, to be honest. So I first started playing when I was 14 or 15, got a set of decks with my mates, and uh, and I've had probably my 1210s for near enough 20 years or something like that. Um, play vinyl mainly, digital vinyl, stuff like that. Um, I'm going to put a link to a couple of online mixtapes of mine in the description. They're pretty old now, probably a few years old, but you get an idea, sort of hip hop, funk, soul, house, that sort of stuff. Um, don't judge me too bad, they're quite old, but hopefully you enjoy them. And don't forget to add your comments on the end of this show, just underneath. Always like to read them. Okay, so now it's time for Bike Cave, one of my favourite parts of the show. Unfortunately, Martin can't be here this week. The, uh, the bit of snow we've had in the UK has affected transport for a, a lot of our guys here. So you're stuck with me on this one but please continue to keep your Bike Cave entries coming in. There's an email address on the screen right now. Of course, you can tag us on the comments below on Facebook and on Instagram. So keep them coming in and please use the hashtag because it makes it really easy for me to spot your Bike Caves. So first up is from Daniel Sakasa. Hi guys, I'm from Nicaragua. Wow, this, this is pretty cool. Um, this was a laundry room, but it's now my Pan Cave Stroke Bike Cave Stroke Home Office. Multi-use room, I'm really into that. I hate looking at messy stuff while I work. So the sliding doors hide most of that, nice touch. Road bike is permanently placed on the tax Neo. That's good, so you don't ever have to take it outdoors. I approve of that. Uh, my MTB is hanging on the living room wall and it's the first thing you look at when you enter the house. Nice, I have a good wife. I like that too, nice touch. Uh, I had to install wallpaper on the wall to hide the scuff marks in the wheels. Oh, this is great. I love that you've got a fan there set up for the turbo, some park tools on the back there. Got a headset press, bit of a home tinkerer. That's pretty good going. Yeah, it's a nice finish line, lubricants and stuff in there. Decent Teflon grease, a nice selection of riding shoes. Hey, it's pretty organized. So I love that calendar hanging on the wall. That is so stylish. Um, let us know what, what device that is you're hanging it from the wall. I'm keen to see that because we want to start doing that on a few of our sets and I obviously want to start doing that in my own place as well. And I love the little kid's bike down there at the bottom. Nice setup. And of course, a shot of you working there. How'd you get on the lefty? I've always kind of had a weird thing for the lefty forks. I think they're nice, you know, but not everyone does. It's a love-hate sort of thing, but nice work. Well into that. So next up is from Jeff Phelps, and this is another apartment-based one. So 
Uh, here's my bike cave, which also happens to be my bedroom. I guess how that, that's things work when you live in an apartment. I built the bench using three pallets from Craigslist and it costs less than two dollars in screws to build. A good workspace doesn't have to be expensive. Yeah, nice one, Jeff. That is exactly my point. It really doesn't matter where you work on your bike. Just send them in, we want to see them. And this is really cool, Jeff. I like the fact you've done this. Although, I do think you could do better than just a, a white sheet on the floor to, for the dust. You could definitely get something cooler down there. But I like the fact that you can get your jump bike and slide it under the desk as well. That is good going. It looks pretty secure as well and pretty sturdy given you've built that out of pallets. I think that's the top effort. I'm well into that. Next up is from Ken Moon. Uh, my wife and I are both 70 years old and both have mountain bikes and gravel bikes despite living in a 40 foot motor coach. It's currently parked at Medowell Mountain Regional Park near Fountain Hills in Scottsdale, Arizona. But it's a home on wheels so my bike cave has to be portable. I've got a beast to the east and she's got bad habits, they're both Cannondales. Uh, the tent stores our bikes and my tools are in the basement. By the way, McDowell is 21,000 um, acres and it has almost 50 miles of desert trails that are really good for mountain bikes. Oh man, that is a seriously big motorhome. That's like one of the ones that the rock stars go on. Got the American flag up there too, nice. Stars and bars. Liking the Cannondales, I've always really liked Cannondales, you know. And that's, do you know what, your mobile bike cave is bigger than my one I've just built in my house. That's ridiculous. I love it. Now you've got some security in there as well, that's good to see. Some heavy duty locks. Nice sort of uh, tool cabinet there. Ah, oh, tidy, and that was it. So out of the bike cave. Hey guys, so really good entries there. Please continue to send them in. I want to see a few more from some really random places around the globe because there's a lot of you that view our channel from all over the world. We've got the US, we've got France, we've got all the rest of Europe. We've even got people as far as the Philippines. So no matter where you're from, send them in. We want to see them. Ah, now it is rewind. This is the retro section of the show, so get to check out all your retro bikes and weird components. And of course, get to tell you some stories about how some of that stuff, like this flex dem, uh, well, doesn't exist anymore, for example, but how that sort of stuff sort of evolves into the modern day version. So suspension forks like that fox is just behind me. In this case, though, we're going to start looking at some of your entries. So first up is from Phil Spencer, and it's a Rally Avanti. 1989 model, it's my first mountain bike and cost a fortune at the time. Shimano DRXT group set, Biopace chain rings, center pool rim brakes, Reynolds frame, complete with a shop receipt and a rally bike builder signature and photo. No way, that is so rare to have that. Just picking up on what we said about rally earlier, your bicycle has been designed and manufactured in Nottingham by the lightweight division of Rally Industries Limited. That is so cool to see. I, I bet not many people have got those. And it's even named and initialed and hand signed Frank Court. Wow, 400 quid. So that was like a serious bike back then, that amount of money. I love the sort of the pulley wheel under the stem. That was so cool back in the day. Yeah, oh, there's those biopace chambers. My knees can feel the pain of those. Now you've got a crud catcher on, not quite a period, but it's kind of like retro of the day. You now it's got nice thumb shifters on there. I guess those brake levers must be like nearly four finger brake levers. Oh, that's really nice. That's a really good looking bike and I can see you still use it now judging by the slicks that are on there. Well, they Schwalbe City Jets, I think. Yeah, nice. Nice one, Phil. Nice to see that. Uh, next up is from Matthew Ansick. Hi, Doddy. Really want to see mine in the retro part of the show. I've sent them in a couple of times now, so hopefully you see them. I have seen them before, but you don't understand how many entries we get and it's so hard to just filter through them all. So thank you for being persistent and sending those in. A couple of older bikes for you. Both were originally my dad's passed down to me. The first one is a 2004 Specialized S-Works Epic FSR disc. Sheesh, long name. Yeah, so I know that. That's the one that's got the brain shock on it. So that's something that I always felt a bit Marmite about. So the brain shock, in case you don't know, it basically decides when it wants to lock out or not. It's like an automated system. It's got an inertia valve. Really intelligent design if you can see it's for cross countries. You Basically, if you pedal your ass off like up as a steep pillar or something, it locks out the suspension, but then you start hitting bumps and it opens it up again. Really smart, although I don't think the earlier ones were that refined. I think the newer ones, which actually don't have a Fox shock on them anymore, I think they've got Rock Shocks unit. The one that I felt, like Sam Gaze's bike, that felt amazing. So actually quite interested to like, curiosity kill the cat a bit to give one of those a try. That was a really nice bike to see. And of course you've made some upgrades on that, so wide bar, shorter stem, set up tubeless, one by. So that's pretty modern actually what you've done to that. Uh, and obviously he said 26 ain't dead. Oh, and there's a second bike as well from Matthew Ansick. So wow, this is old, what is this? 
That's just a 1992 giant rink on, or rinse on. Uh, it's now his commuter bike, stripped it down to the frame, rattle canned it himself, all newer parts on there, but the frame, fork and stem are original now. I mean, it's hilarious. Look at the length of the head tube on that bike considering how high the bars are. It's a real early mountain bike, shared a lot of similarities with road bikes, really, with a shorter front end basically to keep the front end low, which is actually not what you want on a mountain bike. You actually want to be a bit higher up for control. And the top tube sloping almost the wrong way. But that's rad that you're still riding there. So that's for a 1992 and it's your daily commuter bike. That's a real good upcycling, recycling way of uh, reusing your bike. Very nice. Uh, next entry is from Ryan Strambuki. Uh, hey GMBN Tech, I live in Florida and I've had this 2001 giant NRS XTC for about seven years now. Picked it up as my first mountain bike, been riding it ever since. I recently converted it to one by. That's nice and smart again, so you're getting use out of an older bike. Uh, but you've had some problems with a rock shock shock on it. So the first image is no shock on it at all. Second image you've got what looks like a Monarch on there. Oh yeah, and there's a shot of the original shock. So that's a rock shock Sid XC. Okay, so what's happened to that? Are you leaking air? Couldn't get a replacement seal for it. That's a shame. Um, I might know someone actually who might be able to get you a seal for that. If you fire a mail to hellotech at gmbn.com um, and just put that in a subject title, I'll see if I can hook you up. No promises, you might not have any left, but I know someone had loads of old school parts for rock shocks, Sid shocks, and stuff. Um, worth a go, get in contact. And thanks for the entry, it looks cool and it's really nice to see that you're still riding the bike. So that was the end of the retro section of the show. Please continue to keep those flowing in. I genuinely love seeing those bikes. I mean, for me, the older the better because there's always some really good stories with them. So don't forget, you can send them in. Use the hashtag, please, which is hashtag rewind. Email address on the screen. Let us know in the comments below. Fire them to us via Facebook and Instagram. The more, the better. So now it's time for top mods. So this is the part of the show where you guys send in images or video clips of all the sort of modifications you've done to your bikes. Now don't be too faced by that. I'm not expecting anyone to have just chucked on a whole new transmission or done some suspension tuning. It could be the tiniest thing, just like replacing a headset or updating some brake pads. Whatever it does to enhance the performance of your bike, I wanna see what you've done. So please get those entries in and use the hashtag top mods. And it makes it really easy for me to find them and put them on next week's show. So if you want to get involved, send them in. First up this week is from Ruben Figuera, who's basically, this is ingenious. I absolutely love this. So have you ever been cleaning your bike and your chain's hanging if you've got the wheels off and you're trying to find a way to keep it on the bike? So Park Tools and various other manufacturers make a little chain hanger specifically for this so you can still rotate it around. But Ruben's gone one better and he's got an old car damper as a chain roller. And have a look at a little video clip on the screen now. This is ingenious. And you can actually see on there, it's actually it's got different grooves for the chain to be in, so the chain line sort of lines up, enables him to spin it through the gears, the axle fits through his frame, which is an or bear, I think, by the looks of it, and enables him to service his bike and keep the chain hung properly at the same time. So although it's not modifying his bike, it's modifying the way he works on his bike. So really into that, nice one, Ruben. Our next entry is from Christian Golubic. Uh, hi, my name's Christian, I'm from Croatia, and I'm 17 years old. All my friends have full suspension bikes, but I've only got an entry level hardtail. They always made fun of me, so I decided to make my bike better. I completely stripped it, painted it, and fixed everything that was needed. Now my bike is not the worst in my crew. I just want to show young people that with a little will and hard work, you can get nice results, and you don't need a lot of money. Have a nice day. Do you know what, this is so impressive. I mean, to be fair, I don't know why your mates took the mick out of you. There's nothing wrong with this, what is it? Is it a Merida, something similar to that, a 29er? Entry level hardtail looks perfectly good to me. No issues with that at all. And you've just completely stripped it down, repainted it, upgraded what looks like everything on it. Painted the forks, or, or is that a new fork? It looks like you've got a boxer sticker on there. New wheels, you've got some specialized graphics on the frame. So you know, we've done a really, really good job of that. I'm well impressed. And you're absolutely right. You know, by all means have pride in whatever you ride, but you do not need a lot of money to ride a nice bike. It's exactly what you do with it. And that's why Top Mods is so good. Nice work, Christian. Really impressed with that. Next up is from Eric Goodall. In the last episode of Ask GMBN Tech, you asked for some mods, and there was a little discussion about the Wolf Tooth Goat Link. I just want to send in my 1x10 conversion. Originally, it had 3x10, uh, which I've completely converted. I started off with the front, to get rid of the front derailleur and installing a one-up components 34 tooth oval chain ring. It worked pretty well for the last weeks of last season. 
In preparation for this year's season, I decided to get some bigger range and installed an 1142 cassette. Then I got a Shimano CS HD500 cassette and a Goat Link and kept my very good XT rear derailleur. Setup's working very smooth and so far I've had no problems. Nice work, Eric. It's always good to see people converting bikes. So impressed with the amount of you that are going to one by as well, because it really does declutter your bike, saves you weight as well, and it just makes everything a bit more simplified. Big fan of one by. I don't think I could ever go back to a bike with a double or triple setup. Although that said, Neil has got the DI2 setup on his with the double front setup. It's kind of interesting because it automatically changes gear for you. You can adjust those parameters. But even then, I think one by is, is the future. That's where it's going. Nice work. Great, some really good top mods in there. Keep them coming in for next week. Love to see them. And tech of the week's a bit of a different one. This is a titanium superbike. So there's a British company called Kingdom Bikes and they make a bike called a Vendetta. This is the XFS, so a titanium full suspension bike based on 27 and a half inch wheels with 143 mil travel out back. Now titanium bikes are absolutely amazing to ride. I've got an old titanium hardtail. I'm a bit gutted that it's a 26 inch wheel bike because it is pretty much, it would have been a bike for life. I still run this bike and I've still got enough spare tires and wheels to keep it going, but at some point down the line, it's gonna become hard for me to do that. Now, Kingdom Bikes are making modernized bikes, 29 inch, 27 and a half in titanium, which is just such an amazing metal to have a bicycle made out of. It doesn't corrode, you don't need to, give it any sort of rust protection or anything like that. It's got a really unique, slightly springy, damped ride to it. And just look how nice this is. Look at the welding and stuff around the head tube. This bike is stunning. So it will fit 27 and a half inch wheels with a 2.6 tire maximum, sometimes a 2.8, depending on the brand. It's got external cable routing. Um, I'm guessing it's easier to, for manufacturer to do it this way, but also I actually quite like external cable routing. It's the same on my Nuke Proof. It makes life a lot easier when changing brakes and seat posts and all that sort of stuff. It's got replaceable alloy dropouts, which is a great idea because obviously if you crash a bike, that's where the damage is gonna occur. And it's got a threaded bottom bracket. Yes, no press fit, good work. And it's got titanium shock hardware. And of course it's really progressive geometry too. So for an XL, which is what I, I generally look at because I ride an XL, so my Scott is 505 and my Nuke Proof is 515. Uh, the XL in, in the Vendetta is 506, so it's very similar. In fact, a lot of the geometry is very similar to the Scott Genius, in fact. So that is, I mean, as far as bikes go, it's quite basic looking, but there's something about it. It just looks industrial and just lush. Okay, so now it's time for a bit of bike build updates. The frame's still not here. I'm still waiting for the frame. It's definitely coming, don't worry. I've been promised that. Um, I've been chatting to the guys from Xfusion about a fork for that, but also a lot of you are still asking about the formula, so I'm not completely decided on that. Although headset choice is seemingly becoming a bit easier, so the Nuke Proof one seems like a good option, great value, I'm all about that. But I'm just having a look on the Santa Cruz website at their base models. So in the UK, I said three and a half earlier, it's 3,599 for the, the base model. And of course, I'm well aware that's not a cheap bike, that is a very expensive bicycle, but it is the base model for Santa Cruz. And of course, most of the Santa Cruz bikes we tend to see a carbon fiber with carbon NV wheels and you know, they're like seven, eight grand bikes. So this particular one on here, they have a RockShox Yari on there. So again, that's another option because you could tune the Yari to be just like a Lyric basically by doing some good stuff to it internally and it's a base fork. Um, but I think if I can, I'll steer away from it because I really do want to pick up some alternative brands. So I need to make contact with Formula just to see what they can do. Neil's helped me out actually, so I was unsure about the drivetrain, so I'm pretty sure I'm going to go for a cassette like the Sunrace or the E13, but Neil's just given me his box component shifter and mech, so that's a really cool setup to put on there, and that is not SRAM and not Shimano, so it's not like I'm against either of those brands, I just think this is a really exciting opportunity to put some alternative componentry on the bike and just showcase some of that stuff out there. Now the dropper post has been raising a bit of conversation amongst people as well. So let me know what you think I should fit in terms of a dropper post, because I'm 50-50 I'm on this. So you could go, arguably for a cheap dropper post, I could even go for something like a giant own brand one, which are very reasonably priced, but I don't know what they're like in the long term, or I could spend a bit more money and go for something like the Bike Yoke, for example, which is completely home serviceable. Now from my point of view, servicing bikes and tinkering with bikes, that makes a lot of sense. So I think you're saving money in the long term by having a product like that. 
I might be less keen to go for something like a reverb in this case because when you have them serviced, you generally need to spend the money to have them serviced properly by an authorized dealer, something like that, and that's gonna cost you money. So I'm quite up for putting stuff on here that's user friendly to service and look after. So at the moment, I'm thinking bike yoke, but let me know the other sort of brands out there that you think are both cheap and worth looking at, like KS perhaps, or E13 and just stuff like that, I wanna know. So let me know and we'll pick it up next week and I really hope that Frame's here next week because I wanna get started on this thing. See you next week. Okay, so that's another GMBN Tech weekly show in the bag. Hopefully you guys have enjoyed watching it as much as I enjoyed presenting it to you. For a couple more really cool videos, click down here if you wanna see Blake's essential car park tricks. You gotta love Blake, he's an absolute nutcase on a bike and some of these are really cool, you gotta see that. And if you wanna see a brake bleeding video in particular for the SRAM bleeding edge style brakes, click up here. I'm gonna be sort of going through some of the older videos and bring them up to date from time to time. I'm gonna remake the standard Avid one and of course the Shimano one as well. So keep watching for those in the future. As always, click on the globe to subscribe because we've got new content coming for you all the time. And of course, if you like the video, give us a thumbs up.